and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at The Cube Research. And I'm joined today by Tom Parker, who's the CTO of NetSpy, for a conversation about the complexities of the attack surface in organizations today and how a proactive security strategy can be a game changer. Tom, welcome. It's great to have you. Thanks for having me, Shelley. Great to be here. I've been looking forward to this conversation. So one of the things I always try and start out with is your backstory. Share with me a little bit about your career journey and how you ended up here. Yeah, so I've been in this industry for, uh, for about 25 years now. Um, this was, uh, I think, my my 23rd uh, visit to Black Hat in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I've seen the industry change quite quite a bit over over those years. Um, from a you know s relatively small gathering of of enthusiasts um, to uh, to growing to the, the the type of type of scale that we see our industry at today, um, I got my start as a as a researcher back in the day, um, looking for software flaws and um, you know turned that into a career in in security assessments and you know that led me uh, down the path of of running businesses, running security practices. Um, before starting Hubble, I was the line of business chief information security officer over AIG Insurance, and uh, Hubble is actually my second company. Um, the the first company I co-founded in in 2010 uh, with Matt DeVoe, and uh, that was a red teaming business that we we sold to Accenture in 2015, where I became their chief technology officer. Awesome. And, you know, so you mentioned Hubble, but I know that I want to tell our audience that you founded Hubble Technology and, and Hubble is a cyber asset attack surface management technology company that was acquired by NetSpy this past June, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, we're just uh, just on about the two month mark at this point. Uh, we were founded. Uh, I founded the company in um, 2020. So I like to say we're a pandemic baby, right? Everyone was on <laughs> lockdown and um what are we going to do? And, you know, I, I decided, well, I'm going to go start another business uh, that we have, you know, this huge problem uh, in, in, in the industry in terms of visibility and um, having situational awareness of, of what's in your operating environment. Right. And uh, with the backing of uh, CrowdStrike's Falcon Fund, I think we were one of the first investments out of CrowdStrike's Fund and uh, Excel, uh, <laughs> one of the biggest names in, in, uh, in uh, cybersecurity investment. Uh, we we launched the business. That's it sounds awesome. like you have a friend on your end that's uh, that wants to join the conversation. Too. I I do have a friend on my end who wants to join the conversation. He feels like he's not getting the attention he deserves. Bless his heart. So, what I wanted to focus on in our conversation today, Tom, is is really kind of a, a dive into what's happening in the industry, what we're seeing from customers as it relates to their challenges and pain points, and you know, from from my standpoint, one thing we know for certain, the, a lack of visibility is a significant challenge, as is the understanding that the attack surface that we're dealing with today, both internal and external, is the root of many of these issues, and that attack surface is actually growing at a rapid pace. Um, and to me. That's where a proactive security approach addresses gaps in visibility and enables organizations to ensure business resilience, which, you know, is kind of sort of important. And it also helps keep up with, you know, innovation, which is happening at a crazy rapid pace. And that's not going to sh slow down any. So what I wanted to ask you, Tom, is that, you know, this is without question a challenging time for businesses from a security standpoint. The attack surfaces are expanding. Teams are challenged by a number of things, including sometimes a dearth of highly skilled talent. Threat actors are getting more sophisticated by the day, in many ways enabled by AI, and the data breaches, they keep coming. So I highlighted some of the concerns that I see from customers in the market, as well as from what we see in our research. What are you seeing and hearing from customers about the security challenges they face and, and how they're addressing those? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you've you've really hit on the major points. I think in many cases, security has today and has always been uh, a challenge of scale and prioritization. Right. Um, I have too many assets in my environment that's continually expanding. It's becoming more complex uh, through innovation. You know, innovation gives us a lot of opportunity to defend our environments a lot more effectively. At the same time, it also creates challenges for us. Um, as we uh, invest more heavily in things like serverless compute, you know, cloud container based uh, applications, 
And, um, you know, a lot of those technologies allow IT departments to expand their, their footprint, their technology footprint more rapidly. And that's a challenge for the CISO, right? They, they were already struggling with a visibility problem. Um, right. it's further compounded that visibility problem. And, you know, when, when I started Hubble, I really wanted to create, you know, I, I, after you exit your first company, people ask, are you going to do another company? Um, and, um, I think there's a lot of variables in, in answering that question, but, um, one of the really important things is you don't just start a business for the sakes of it. Um, I'm right. sure some people do, but, um, and, and so I, I spent, you know, a good amount of time really thinking about this problem set and how I wanted to solve it. And, um, I really, you know, we created a solution at Hubble that was the product that at AIG, I wish I had, um, and that I wish, um, you know, my clients had when I was at, uh, Accenture security and there really just was a big gap in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, um, um in the market, um, for a solution that really was end to end. We talk a lot at the moment about platformification of, of security. Right. That was, I think one of the hot topics that. At, uh, at Black Hat this year, especially off the back of uh, uh, the CrowdStrike outage. Like, do we trust security platforms? Is right. it clear or not? Yeah. And the reason we're having a lot of those conversations is because the security product industry as a whole is very fragmented. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of different point solutions, a lot of different kind of bits and pieces that the CISO has to uh, stitch together in order to effectively uh, create, a, a, you know, an end solution that can really solve some problems for them. And uh, the visibility space back in 2020 was no exception. There were products that would just give me visibility of uh, my on-prem systems. There were tools I could use to help discover my external attack surface. There were tools out there I could help to discover my cloud attack surface. There were different tools I would need to discover my uh, application attack surface yeah. and nothing really that brought all of these different disciplines together. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the fundamental thesis really around Hubble was creating, um, you know, being a, the cartographer, uh, for space, basically, instead of space, right. Uh, the Hubble telescope is obviously mapping space, right. mapping your, your network and helping you, um, understand, um, what the different paths are and the relationships are and, 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 and just like space, right. Uh, your network continues to expand every day. Yeah. It, it, um, you need something that's really going to keep up with that, that sort of expansion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we did some research, uh, in advance of RSA this year. And it's funny because we went in, uh, we did this research study, just a quick pulse survey uh, with our research partner, Enterprise Technology Research. And we went into the the research study expecting a move, a trend toward platformization. And what came out of that research was really interesting because I, I can't remember if it was 150 or 300 respondents. It, it wasn't an insignificant number, but but the respondents to that survey or practitioners um, indicated that they weren't moving to platformization and embracing that at the rate we expected them to. And part, and we, so we had a lot of conversations around that at RSA. And of course, you know, the, the platform companies were preaching the platform gospel and this is the only way to go and blah, blah, blah. But what we were hearing from practitioners was that, you know what, we understand that value proposition, but we're not there today. And what we're looking for is best in class solutions for this and for this and for this. And much to your point, sometimes having all those capabilities and, and using a platform that has good enough, you know, visibility capabilities or whatever, like good enough isn't good enough. And so th- these practitioners said that their stack remained, um, they were continuing to add to their stack. They did not see um, approaching consolidation in the next 12 to 18 months. And they were very happy with that. So it was just, it was really interesting to hear that and to see that. But I do, I do see the benefit in a solution, of course, that can be best in class and connect all these dots together. But it was, I, I always like it when, you know, you go into something with some sort of hypotheses and and then, you know, the industry tells you differently. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I'll, I'll find that research and share it with you. You might 
Yeah, that'd be really interesting. Listen, I, I mean, I think a lot of the conversations that are going on about security platform consolidation are the same yeah. conversations we had 15 years ago about cloud. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, so Microsoft's a great example of this, right? Where if you remember way back when, you know, Microsoft was getting a lot of flag because of having monopoly on web browsers. Right, right. right? And that packaging it with the operating system. And at that time, you know, if you asked probably the same people, or at least the CIOs within those organizations, would you buy um, your operating systems, your servers, your cloud, all from Microsoft? They'd probably say, no, definitely not. And it's, right. I, I would never consolidate around that. Of course, look at where we are today. Absolutely. Um, and so I think it, the, the question is not necessarily whether it happens. I think it's just a question of timing and, and how long yeah. it takes for people to, yeah. to come around to, to understanding those benefits. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So before this conversation, I was looking at, you know, funny, the things that happenstance throws across your field of vision, but I was thinking about this conversation and I happened to be looking at Cohesity's Global Cyber Resilience Report 2024 just came out. They surveyed both public and private organizations across multiple companies or countries rather. Um, and the biggest the biggest revelation from the survey was the overestimation of cyber resilience capabilities among organizations. So I thought, oh, Tom's going to like this. Um, you know, I think we experienced this a, about a month ago or so while organizations were navigating that tiny little global outage that shook the world. Um, and what I love about it is that I've long been, a, you know, a beating the cyber resilience drum, but I think that incident um, really brought the topic of cyber resilience and business continuity even more to the fore than ever before. Um, there were some interesting findings here, though, that I thought I would share. So the report showed that 2% of survey respondents indicated they could recover their data and restore business processes within 24 hours of a cyber attack. This, however, contrasted with 78% of respondents who said they were confident in their cyber resilience strategy. So you have this huge group of people who are confident in their strategy, but you know a, a, a number of them saying they could not even recover business processes within 24 hours of the cyber attack. And that 2% is a small number. There's some bigger numbers here in a second I'll address. Um, another data point that I thought was really interesting is that organizations seem oddly willing to pay ransoms. And 75% of the respondents in that report indicated their organization would pay over a million dollars to recover data and restore business ops. 22% were willing to pay over 3 million. And in the last year, 69% of respondents admitted to paying ransom despite 77% of those organizations having policies against making ransomware payments. Mm -hmm. So I, all of that I thought was really interesting. Um, you know, recovery times reported by survey respondents revealed there were significant vulnerabilities. And I mentioned just a minute ago that 2% of the survey respondents said that they could recover in 24 hours. 18% said they'd need one to three days. 34% said they'd need four to six days. 31% said they'd need one to two weeks. And 16% of survey respondents said they would need three plus weeks to recover. So all that happens in my head when I hear that is dollar signs, <laughs> you know? I mean, could you imagine your business not being able to conduct business for even, you know, four to six days? I mean, so 34, um, you know, this is more, greater than 50% of the survey respondents said they would need more than four to six days to recover yeah. business operations. And that to me, that's, that's crazy. I think the reality is uh, most of the respondents probably don't really know the answer to those questions. Um, I think, uh, you know, I will say that just from experience, things like paying ransoms, uh, response to an incident, obviously, you know, there's a lot of variables in the, the severity of a cyber incident that right. drives um, how quickly you might recover from that. Right. Um, and I think just from experience, talking to boards, CIOs, CEOs, ultimately, you know, whether you pay a ransom is not up to the CISO anyway. Right. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a conversation generally you have at the board level with yeah. your lawyers, right? Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, paying a ransom, you could be sending millions of dollars to a criminal group that might decide to use that money to, you know, c go conduct a terrorist attack. Or, I mean, there's, there's a lot of downstream, you know, um, you know, and I mean, and, and, and in all seriousness, you know, there's a lot of um, relationships that, that uh, you know, if you, if you read, 
um, some of the reports about where some of this money is going. It's going to organizations that are engaged in kinetic attacks that are affiliated with um, nation yeah, states, nation yeah. states, and terrorist organizations. And yeah. so, this is serious stuff. And I think you know, when it comes to ransomwares in particular, a lot of organizations just haven't really had the conversation at that level within their organization. Um, and you know, obviously, when it when it when when it comes around and they they get the ransom right, it forces a conversation. But um, you know, I, I think the other thing is, you know, and, until you know how bad the bleeding is, you're never going to know what your pain tolerance is. Yeah, to you know, absolutely. you know, until you decide, you know, you know what we are going to pay this because the alternative is going to cost us more. <laughs> right. Probably. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I thought the you know a year ago now, right? We were faced with the casino outages in Las Vegas. Yes. Um, both Caesars and MGM, and you saw uh, one organization, um, you know, Caesars, that were pretty quick to pay the ransom, yeah. uh, and then MGM, you know, really dug their heels in, and um, so it really does go to show that you know I, I don't think that's necessarily wrong and right answers here. It really right. you know, back to your question about business resilience um, or cyber resilience. And um, one of the points I was going to make is I, I I think you know you have to talk about cyber resilience in a bigger um, uh, uh, stream of thought in terms of business resilience, yes, with cyber being a, a component of that, and um, you know the components of your business, right? Your processes, how much money you st- you stand to lose every day from different processes failing. Right. Um, every business is a little bit different, and I think um, you know it's uh, it's it's important to not talk about cyber resilience in a vacuum, and you know have a you know, make sure you're discussing it in the in the broader context. Yeah, that absolutely agree. It is definitely a board level conversation, and it is all about business resilience, not just limited to cyber. So, I want to talk a little bit about cyber asset attack service management tech, of course, and how the Hubble acquisition has added to the value of the NetSpy portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. So, as um... As I mentioned earlier, I think um, asset visibility was something that I saw as a significant uh, gap in the market. Lots mm-hmm. of solutions not really providing that holistic view. So that's really where um, Hubble was focused. And when we when we first met the team um, here at NetSpy, it was super clear that we just had very uh, aligned visions in terms of the direction uh, the market is going, in terms of uh, security platforms as a whole. But also at, at a more macro level, when it comes to visibility and how we wanted to go about uh, solving the uh, the challenge here at NetSpy, we already had a attack surface management product in market that was doing external visibility, and uh, far superior from an external attack surface uh, standpoint than anything we built at Hubble. And so the ability to marry those two capabilities together into a the solution to give customers that outside in, inside out visibility across the enterprise was just something that um, you know we, we we were extremely excited about the idea from from day one when we started chatting and mm-hmm. and now obviously two months into the acquisition we're well on the way uh, to integrate those capabilities and um, you know the experience I've had integrating multiple M and A's in the past both on the buy and sell side of things. Um, I think, you know, we, we, we've, we've gone into this really eyes wide open and, um, I think the team's doing an amazing job of, of bringing the two products together, um, which, uh, we, we actually already started to do demos of out at Black Hat a couple of weeks ago. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know, at the end of all this, the customers win, right? And that's always what I'm looking for. Um, you know, I think that, um, you touched on this, you know, visibility matters. And I personally, I think visibility, visibility matters today more than ever before, because so much more is happening. Um, you can't mitigate risks that you can't see. We find, I find that many organizations are not at a point where they fully understand the role visibility plays in, in security operations. And, and there's some complexity here that can be challenging to manage. So talk about this a little bit. I mean, we've touched on this a little bit. You know, why is visibility into internal and external attack surfaces difficult? Yeah. I think it's just because, or has been difficult in the past, is because there are uh, the information that 
you need to answer those questions is stored in lots of different places and lots of different formats. Right. And so normalizing that information, bringing it together, deduplicating the information, and then applying analytics to stitch together the information so that you understand how things are related to one another, that isn't trivial. And um, and so really the, the, the bulk of the IP that we had at Hubble was around the way that we do that stitching, the way that we do the du 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 duplication in order to bring together these different corpuses of information um, to give you a single view of uh, the customer's asset universe. Right. Right. Well, it makes perfect sense. So, Tom, what's ahead for NetSpy? I know, you know, the company's grown a ton over the course of the last couple of years, shifted and focused a little bit, made the Hubble acquisition, you know, and based on conversations that I've had with your team, I think there's some good things in the works. What do you see ahead that you're the most excited about? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I, I personally am um, the most excited about uh, taking on the, the, the CTO role here at, at NetSpy and the trajectory we're on is, you know, NetSpy is clearly a leader in security services. Um, that's completely undisputed. Um, you know, we, we have incredible coverage over the Fortune 500 in terms of um, traditional pen test uh, services. The ability for us to pivot and uh, start to make that more of a technology-driven strategy right. um, and taking it from uh, the kind of traditional pen test uh, where someone gets a PDF at the end of the, the assessment and maybe it's once a year to more of an ongoing process, um, reoccurring pen testing, um, reoccurring retesting, um, really to achieve that state of cyber uh, and business resilience delivered through a penetration testing as a service platform or PTAS as we call it. Um, and more recently started starting to integrate that into our broader security platform, yeah. which is where we bring other disciplines together, such as breach and attack simulation. And of course, attack surface management. Um, you know, I think one of the first points I made at the beginning of the conversation was security being a scale and prioritization issue. Yeah. Um, and how, the inability to understand what's on your environment impacts so many practitioners within the security organization, whether you're talking about vulnerability management, security operations, risk and compliance, um, having a platform that all of those groups can access that are looking at their own information that matters to them, such as what vulnerabilities uh, the NetSpy team found on the recent assessment, but then being able to prioritize that um, based on asset information. So I've got thousand systems that have this vulnerability i've got three people on my team to actually fix it all where do i start how do i allocate resources well the answer is you bring in information from our chasm module and you say okay out of these vulnerabilities which systems are missing endpoint protection which of these systems are encrypted which of these systems have an, is sensitive information on them i'm really starting to use real data that i can trust to start making smart decisions yeah. and uh you know not kind of boiling the ocean, but being extremely methodical about the way that I, I uh, approach my job. Well, I think that makes good sense. And it, you know, I mean, it just, um, you can't manage what you can't see. You can't combat what you can't see. You can't be proactive when you don't have visibility. And I think the other part of that, that, you know, that I'm thinking about when you're talking about this is that trying to get away from silos and, you know, bringing teams together, being able to access information that they need that's relevant to them and having that real-time information, that real-time access to data, helping drive decisions, you know, all of that is really kind of business mission critical today. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, this is not a nice to have. Right. It's something that, um, and I think a lot of CISOs are starting to come around to the idea yes. that this is something that really does have to underpin any mature security program. Um, you know, I've gone invested in, you know, whichever EDR provider, I CrowdStrike, Sentinel One. <laughs> That's a great investment, but how do I know it's on everything it needs to be on? How do I know if people are uninstalling agents? How do I know if an agent, you know, uh, um, you know, it really, whether you're talking about vulnerability management or the efficiency of your SOC team or how quickly you're responding to regulators, um, this capability really can, can help everybody. Yeah, that makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. 
Tom, if you could leave our audience with one piece of advice on the, you know, cyber resilience, business resilience front, what would that be? Yeah, I think, it, I, and I'm going to tie it back to the visibility conversation. Yeah. Uh, but I think the first thing is think about your business, think about your business processes, and then think about what assets support those business processes, because that's really what's going to allow you to drive prioritization um, and ultimately um, a much more effective and informed security program. Yeah. You know, I, I look at this and I think that, you know, if business resilience is the goal and it's it, not just cyber resilience, as we talked about before, business resilience is the goal. And isn't that the goal of every company? I mean, it certainly should be. Mm -hmm. It's safe to say that uh, having a proactive approach to security is so critical. Um, you know, proactive security leads to an improved state of business resilience. It provides a holistic, accurate, real-time understanding of a company's risk profile. And, and you know, I think that part of the challenge here, and I, I, I very much understand, you know, we've, I've had so many conversations with CISO talking about, you know, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I mean, the, the game of the cybersecurity business these days is kind of like playing a game of whack-a-mole, you know, what's happening here? Oh my God, what's something, you know, and it's, it's trying to keep up. And, and so you've got an attack service that is more complex than ever before. That's not going to change. It's going to get more complex over time. You know, as we talked about siloed solutions that can only address part of the problem, not the answer, a complete picture of threat environments, you know, is, is the underpinning of a proactive security approach. And, you know, I'll end this conversation the same way I started it. Visibility matters now more than yeah. ever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a key part of any organization's not only cyber resilience strategy, but business resilience strategy, I think. So um, I knew this was going to be a great conversation. Tom Parker, CTO of NetSpy, and it was, you did not disappoint. But thank you so much for making time and joining me and, and talking about what it is that you and your team are looking at and I'm thinking that um, there are good things ahead. Absolutely, there are. And uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me, Shelley. Absolutely. Well, we'll do it again for sure. Thanks. All right. And to our viewing and listening audience, this is Shelley Kramer with the Cube Research. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. And we'll see you again here on the Security Angle next time. Mm -hmm.